Okay, so good morning everyone. This presentation is Teaching Elementary Spanish 1 Online, Lessons and Successes, and we will be presented by Christy DeClaris and Dana Pila. Uh, Christy is an instructional designer at Rutgers University Camden. She works with instructors to assist in development of robust online courses in Sakai, in addition to utilizing technology in the traditional classroom. Previous presentations include Explain Everything and Keynote for Presenting and Annotating Slideshows and Student Polling with Socrative and Poll Everywhere. Prior to becoming an instructional designer, Christy taught high school history, where she also supported her colleagues in learning new classroom technologies. Dana is a lecturer at Rutgers University Camden and a Spanish teacher at the middle school level. She has taught grades 2 through 12 over the past 10 years and additions, in addition to courses taught at the university level. Uh, she enjoys attending and presenting at workshops at the state and regional levels. Um, some past topics have included assessment in the world language classrooms, how to create thematically organized assessments at the novice, intermediate, and pre-advanced levels, and meeting the needs of all learners, how to structure classroom activities and assessments to include students with special needs. Outside of teaching, Dana is also a freelance translator and interpreter. Uh, please note that all attendees um, in this session are muted. If you have any questions, uh, please enter them in the chat box in GoToWebinar. You'll see that in the bottom left or bottom right hand corner. Um, enter questions at any time throughout the meeting and at the end of the session we'll go back and we'll review those questions. Um, this session is recorded. It will be available at a later date on the Aperio YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions uh, with video, audio, um, or any questions, just uh, you go ahead and enter those in the chat box as well. Uh, so, uh, Christine, Dana, you can go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you, Derek. Um, this is Christy. I'm just going to start us off. Thanks for attending Teaching Elementary Spanish 1 online. Um, so, I'm going to start us off by looking at... Oops. Oh, goodness. Of course, my slide shows not advancing. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I'm going to start off with the introduction and talk a little bit about um, the context for this course. So Dana taught this course in the summer, and she's also currently teaching it in the fall semester. Um, and what we're going to really focus on is what happened over the summer and what that meant for how the online course had to be structured. So here at Rutgers, uh, summer courses are pretty condensed. They run over four weeks. If it was a traditional face-to-face -face course, the course would be meeting about three and a half hours a day for four days a week. So Dana used this to try and figure out how long the students should be working each week on coursework. Um, because in online courses at Rutgers Camden, most of the time, really almost 100% of the time, the courses are being presented asynchronously. So there are no live meetings between Dana and her students. And this can present a lot of challenges in trying to learn a language. So I'm just going to introduce you briefly to the course structure in Sakai. And then after that, Dana is going to talk about the course content and assessments. And then we'll talk about what we decided to change for the fall semester. So this is what um, the main page of the course looked like in the summer when you entered the Sakai page. And you can see we have the five chapter lessons pages on the left-hand menu. And the students would navigate to each lesson page to see what their assignments was, were for that chapter. So for when, if they click on the chapter one lessons page, they'll see the assignments they have and what day they're due. They'll see any tutorials they have to watch. And if they scroll down, they'll see um, what assignments they have due that day. So if they have to, to complete a voice thread, if they have to visit Wiley Plus and complete homework assignments there, uh, th that was the general navigational structure that the students had to complete each day of the course. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dana so she can talk about um, how she structured the tutorials and the assignments and assessments um, that would be shown on these lessons pages. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Dana, that's me in the Eagles t-shirt. Um, that's one of my messages to the class, probably. So the way I did the course was I decided that um, part of the learning had to be how to navigate the actual Sakai page. So before we started in on the Spanish content, I gave all of the students tours of Sakai 
through tutorials, um, through tutorials, I can't remember the tool I used, but it was one where I could do some kind of screencasting, and I would upload these as tutorials. So I did a Sakai tutorial, a syllabus tutorial, and a voice type tutorial. This is basically how to go through Sakai and click on the icons to find the work, how to go through the syllabus and find out when things were due, and how to actually answer on a voice thread. Now, to make sure the students were actually watching them, I decided early on to make, first of all, every tutorial five minutes or less. Um, because Emily had mentioned to me that was best practice. Um, people tend to listen more when there's less content being shouted at them, which I totally agree with as a teacher. And then I also decided to assess them on every single tutorial I made. Um, yes, it was time consuming, but it showed me whether or not they understood what I was saying. So I really needed to make sure they understood how the course was set up before we actually got into the Spanish, because I didn't want a lot of questions about how do I make a voice thread? How do I respond to voice thread? I don't understand where to find that. So I tried to get this out of the way the first couple days of the class. Um, also, besides that, to keep some kind of connection to my audience, to my students, I made written announcements, which I sent out to email as well. And I also made video message of the day. So since, like Christy was saying, the summer course was so condensed, um, there was about four to six hours of work due a day. So every day at the end of the day, I left them a message. So I felt like it's kind of to be their cheerleader, to make sure that they're on track, uh, to make sure they understand that I'm, I'm concerned about them, that I'm helping them, that even though I'm on the side grading, I'm also there you know, being their teacher, their professor. Hola, estudiantes. Feliz viernes. Happy Friday. Um, tonight is your first set of assignments from Chapter 2. So you'll be doing VoiceThread 1. You'll be completing a little presentation about your mochila. You probably watched a <laughs> tutorial about the university and another one on classroom. So you'll and notice that I'm doing these in English. Now, I, all of my tutorials are in Spanish and all of the works in Spanish, but it was really important for me that the message of the day was in English because all of their, most of their native languages were English. They at least take their courses and records in English. And I felt like to make a connection to them, they have to understand what's going on in the course. So it was important for me to kind of go over, this is what needs to get done today, or this is what you've already done, great job on that, and do that in English. And I feel like that creates a nice classroom atmosphere when the students understand what the professor is saying. We have an added problem in world language classes where the students say they don't understand, them, so they have to negotiate meaning. So this is the one time they don't have to negotiate meaning. I'd like to see that grade by later this evening. Uh, everyone, have a great weekend. Nos vemos el lunes. Ciao. So always try to end the day with a smile, you know, greeting my students. Um, in the fall course, I don't do this every day, but maybe every week or every two weeks. Um, but it's for the same purpose. Okay, so like Christy said, this is how I originally had the course set up. I was just thinking, as a student, what would I want to say? I'd want things to be clear, as clear as possible. So I had every day at the top and then everything that was due that day. So you could see that I have, to, the structure was generally tutorial, you know, screencast mostly, quiz. Um, at the very end, you see a voice thread assessment. I tried to be as clear as possible posting all the directions directly on the Sakai page so that students were not confused. I liked um, the most, I really liked how there's varied types of assessments you can make on Sakai. So when I was making my assessments, I tried to really vary up each question. I figured, oh, you know, sometimes I'm going to have one audio question, one multiple choice question, and one free response question all within the same quiz. So as you can see over here, um, the students had to pick the right answer, que hora es, and this person got it right, so on the social media. And I always get feedback for students. Um, normally, you'd see the name here, but I took all that off for privacy reasons, but I try to always address them by name when I leave a comment for them, and I always tell them, good job, great job, or if they got it wrong, oh, this is why I think you have it wrong. You'll also notice that I really, really enjoyed using the feedback feature and the answer key feature because I like that students can get the immediate feedback uh, to control for any kind of cheating. I had all the feedback released the morning after the quiz was due. So if these quizzes were due 11.45 at night, I had the feedback released at, let's say, 8 in the morning. This is to account for 
any tech issues someone might have been having, like for instance, if someone couldn't get on and press submit by accident, they can email me and I can open it back up for them without any other students having seen the feedback. Because uh, you have to control to make sure that no one's sharing answers. So I love that feedback feature. And then also, I would also give them additional feedback other than the feedback that I left on Sakai. Um, I also gave them presentations for every single unit. Now, I decided not to give traditional exams, traditional midterms and finals and exams. The reason being that you have to assume with an online course, they can always have their book open in front of them. They could always have other resources open, and you really can't control for that. The only way to control for that is by giving them assessments where they really cannot cheat by looking things up. So every time I made an assessment, I thought, okay, how can I make this so that they could show me their learning even if they have the book in front of them? So you have to give them things that, that enforce them to do more critical thinking. Um, and also, I give them things that let them talk about their own lives. This kind of lets them, first of all, me get to know them in Spanish, but also it makes me have quality control. Like every student has a different presentation because they're all talking about their lives. Like this one was about their families. Um, as you can see, I keep it as detailed as possible um, so that they understand exactly what they have to do. I give all the directions in English. Um, and this one, I let them use anything they wanted to make it. I said they can make a video, they can use a Prezi, they can use Animoto, they can upload this to Vimeo. So I show them there's all different ways to make a presentation. We don't need to have, you know, 28 PowerPoints. Um, so a lot of students did experiment with these technologies, mostly because they're free. And because a lot of the students really enjoy doing stuff that's different and they, they like to look for things that are different. So I only had maybe in a class of 28, two students that made a PowerPoint. Most of them used Prezi or Animoto that they really enjoyed especially with the voiceover options. Um, so this is just an example of a type of final assessment for a chapter. So rather than the test, you're seeing this. And I really enjoyed getting to know the students this way. And I think from what they've told me, they enjoy getting to share this information with me. Because when do you get to ever share this kind of information with a professor at college? So here we have a student talking about his family in Spanish, and he's talking about his, his sister, um, he's describing his sister, so he's using information from the chapter, but he's applying it in a different situation. So he's showing me that, you know, with a picture he can describe someone, and I can see whether he's describing them properly, he can talk about, he can, he can show me his use of gender, let's say in Spanish, by changing the end of the adjective, et cetera. So these are just ways for me to check for comprehension um, and to see if the students are learning. Oh, I love the audio quiz option, love it. So this is one of my favorite ones because I like to assess their speaking um, formally. And I like to see, like, can they actually say this in Spanish? I like to see how long they're taking, and I like how on Sakai, once it's submitted, you can see, wow, a student took 40 minutes to tell me five different times. Well, this means they're looking up everything in their book or on the internet. This means they don't really know it. Oh, this other student only took three minutes. This means the student really had a grasp of this before they went on to the audio quiz. So what do I do in that case? Well, I don't ever accuse students of cheating, you know. But if a student took 60 minutes, I might say, I noticed that you had a lot of difficulty with this because you took so long to you know, really understand and you were looking up the answers. What can I do to support you to help have this easier next time? So I definitely still accepted all the assignments, and but I let the students know in a way that I'm watching over them and I know how long they're taking on each assignment. So I really like this feature in Sakai, and I like the fact that if you want to, you could give the student two chances to answer it um, and to pick their best answer. Even audio on this one. Yeah, we do. And it was it's also nice because you can choose the time limit for how long you want the students to have to record their response as well. And, and I think I I'm pretty sure I did mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So yeah, here's the student example for the answer. Es la una y diez de la tarde. No, so she made a mistake there, but that's fine. Son las cinco de la noche. And you'll see I wrote down bait that is twenty. Son las ocho y media de la mañana. Es media noche. Okay, so I did some scaffolding, you'll see, like, so just instead of just letting them, you know, do it on their own, I put son las or esa, I gave them kind of like the grammat 
grammatical structure so that they can have more confidence doing it. And I definitely wrote her name in the comments. I just edited it out for this. And I said, you know, great job. Um, I forget what I said sorry for. I think something maybe didn't work one time and she had to, I had to re-release it. But, and I put their feedback right there so they know what they did wrong. And I try to give this back as, as soon as possible. Immediate feedback is really important um, for students. So it might not be, you might, not, might not be able to give it back, the feedback in one day, but you should do it for some of this in a couple days. Otherwise, it doesn't have as much of a purpose. Um, students tend to apply feedback when they get it sooner rather than later. Another example of a written assignment that wouldn't be um, your traditional quiz is we did this whole idea of what's on our university campus. And um, I pulled out you know, the Rutgers PDF from the Rutgers website of our Camden campus. And I said, why don't you label the campus in Spanish? And I let them pick, pick 15 different buildings or classes. So giving them choice so you know every student can have a different map. They could decide what they put on it. They could definitely use their resources to hand this in. And then I can check for comprehension by looking at the map. Now, this student was a little bit techy, as you can say, because you could see he put the actual answers right on the map. He actually edited the PDF. Other students simply just made their own maps, maybe did a Microsoft Word document, uploaded that to Sakai. Other students wrote it directly into the, the, the feature where you can write directly on Sakai. Um, I, I understand just because a student takes an online class doesn't mean they're techy. You know, sometimes they take it for convenience. So I give them different options in terms of submitting because I don't want anyone to feel like the technology is getting away in, in the way of learning. So I think students appreciate that, but you will get almost half of your students doing it this way. A lot of them like to use the tools that they have um, with technology. And for me, you know, this is a great learning activity. Like I could say, okay, what did you learn from this? Well, you could tell me places on a campus in Spanish. And that was what one of the objectives for the course was. So for me, the best tool of the course and of Sakai is the use of VoiceThread. Now for me, going into this course, one of my big concerns was how am I going to get them speaking for real, really negotiating meaning with it being asynchronous. And the only way to really do this is with VoiceThread. So I use VoiceThread as a negotiation of meaning tool. I didn't use it as a presentation tool. I use it to get students speaking to me and to each other at times and understanding me. So I structured the whole course around VoiceThread. VoiceThread is what you would traditionally call in class participation. I've never been a big believer in grading participation. How are you supposed to grade participation, right? But the way I did it on VoiceThread was if you participated in every single voice and on every slide, you received 25 out of 25 points for doing it. Whether or not what you said was correct, whether or not the grammar was correct, it didn't matter to me. I wanted to hear you speaking. Now, I still gave feedback as if it were a real assessment because it is a real assessment. It's just not an assessment based on right and wrong. By doing it this way, the students were, had no fear. So they can go on there knowing even if they made a mistake, they could still get full credit. And the other thing is I let them look at each other's comments because we do that in class. You know, your weakest student, you don't call on first, you call on after you've called on 10 others so they can hear their, their, um, the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Oh, what was that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so basically, I use VoiceThread to, to really unite the class and to create a classroom atmosphere and to create that kind of warm feeling you have when you're all supporting each other in class. Um, it was mandatory, so if you didn't do it, you got 0 out of 25, but if you did it, you got 25 out of 25. There was no in-between. This encouraged everyone to do it because it was an easy A grade, but it also made them learn a lot about the content that was going on. So I'm going to give you some examples of VoiceThread. Did I miss something here? Community building? Uh, no, we have a, I, uh, We just have an example of the okay. icebreaker of VoiceThread on this slide. Great. So the first VoiceThread correct that the students had to do in this semester? Yes, exactly. Social worker or going to be a social worker. So 
I tried to get the student's feedback on her icebreaker. So this one student told me she was a social worker. Third student or third student to tell me they have children. So you know, and I tried to make a personal connection right away. So this was assignment number one in English again because you want to create this warm classroom atmosphere. And I gave every single student personalized feedback on this with my video voice thread. Now this student did do a video voice thread. We didn't show it, but she did a video voice thread. And then I gave a video comment back to her because I wanted it to feel like a conversation. So it was my immediate way to connect with her um, and her way to feel like she's being heard and she understands that I know what her needs are in terms of learning for the course. And I just want to clarify before we look at some more voice thread examples that um, at Rutgers we have an LTI integration of voice thread in Sakai. So voice thread shows up as a tool in the left hand menu and the students don't have to navigate to another website to complete their voice threads. They can access it right in the course. Okay, so here's another example of one of the voice threads I gave. Hola, yo soy tu profesora Rina y tengo algunas preguntas. ¿Cómo te llamas? ¿De dónde eres? Yo soy Dina y yo soy de Cherry Hill. So I modeled a question and answer. Yo soy, yo soy de Cherry Hill. <laughs> and we had the students answering. You can see um, Christy um, doctored up a nice little clipboard image <laughs> of each student to protect their privacy. I thought that was hysterical. So you can see now these voice threads are all going to be in Spanish. So when I went into the course content, um, you know, I teach my class, I would say, all the content 100% in Spanish, um, which is, you know, obviously you have to do a lot of workarounds when it's an intro class, but it's possible. So I didn't want to change that for the online course. I think a lot of downfalls of Spanish online courses is too much is taught in English. It doesn't need to be. It's just that the students need to have comprehensible input. They have to understand what's going on. So at the very beginning, you could see that I had a question and I modeled an answer. And I asked very little, what's your name? Where are you from? So it's an intro question, but we're doing it in Spanish. So I'm still getting that, you know, that feel where I'm getting to know the students and they're getting to know me. And they're getting to know each other because they can all see each other's answers. Um, another thing I did was to just so they understand what they're doing is I did a screenshot of each chapter page from the online book and I put that as the first page of the um, voice thread in addition to having the objectives pop up which I think Christy has on the next slide. So I always had the objective written in English. You will learn how to talk about what you do in and around campus by conjugating verbs. So I didn't state the objective, but I wrote it, and we decided as a department that was good, like that was good enough, like it wasn't necessary to write it and state it. And I feel like this also lets the students know that they're doing this for a purpose. Like they're not just doing this to practice. Like we actually have an objective for this voice set and for the chapter, and this is what you're learning. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Tengo una pregunta para ti. Uh, ¿Qué haces tú normalmente cuando estás en el campus de Rutgers? So, what do you do when you're normally on Rutgers campus? Yo normalmente um, llego a las 4 de la tarde, voy a mi oficina. I'm just saying what I do there. Eh, I get there at 4, uh, I'm in my office. Doy clase y después a veces compro so you can see I'm giving a real long modeling answer and I think this helps a lot of students. Um, obviously they're not going to copy my answer so you're going to see another student give, I think it's a boy, yes. <laughs> So now he's telling me he drinks Yo coffee. Voy a la clase. I go to I go to my house Yo or in class. Estudiando. Sort of tried to say I studied and say right that's okay. Con mis amigos. Studies with his friends. Finalmente voy a la casa. So you can see that he took my structure and he restated it in his own words. So this is what I'm encouraging students to do by experimenting on voice thread. Um, they don't. They don't need to feel like they have to read something out of the book. Yo llego a mi clase en la mañana. 
Auntie's baby classes, yo, yo, you need to so, I don't know how much you can hear in Spanish, but you can Just hear that. Classes, Similar yo, structure. Can you can hear your content. So the students can listen to each other and kind of be like, okay, that's all that's expected of me. Like, I can do that. I can do that in Spanish. I don't have to be afraid. And I can get out there and try it out. It goes in the um, Now, I just wanted to show you progression. So now we're on Chapter 5. So, you know, that was Chapter 2, I think. Now we're four weeks into the course. This is the last week of the course. So now I ask an open-ended question. So by the end of the course, I was doing less modeling, um, which is what you would do in class. Like you want to see, can students really answer on their own? They don't need as much modeling. They don't need as much scaffolding by the end. And then I think we have a student for this. Okay, so she shared she liked to write poetry. Um, so students, um, they can do it. You know, they. I think if you create the course where they don't have to have fear, where they feel supported, you can start giving more and more things towards the end of it, where they're not afraid to just you know give of themselves and like really talk about themselves. Like in Spanish, we're we're lucky we can do that. Like I can actually structure a course around their personal interests um, because they're learning a language. Um, and I know you all teach different subjects here, but if you can find a tie-in personally, it really does make a difference to students. And they generally do like to share of themselves, even though it's in a semi-public forum. Now, this is a great tool with VoiceThread, um, using VoiceThread for collaboration. So I've done this more in the fall than I did in the summer. But towards the end of the course, I wanted them to talk about themselves in Spanish give a little info about what they do in their free time, what classes they take, and then I wanted other students to go on and ask them additional questions and make comments. Um, this is just a way to foster community in your classroom and also to um, teach the course content. And just to clarify before she plays it, the student did have a video in the center yeah. of the screen there. It, it wasn't just a static cartoon picture. Um, we just wanted <laughs> to keep the students private. Right. Christy did a lot of fancy editing for this because you, you, you haven't heard one student name at all thanks to Christy. <laughs> about your daughter, like I knew she had a daughter because she said before. about themselves and doing it in Spanish like I was really happy with this because this is what I would have wanted in class you know for them to stay in target language say something meaningful share something about their lives and I feel like we started allowed me to run this course like I would have in class so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the changes that we decided to make between the summer course and the fall course as far as the actual design in Sakai went so what you're looking at now is the summer course. And this is a typical lesson page in the summer course that has tutorials all on one page for one chapter and quizzes and assignments. And the students, it's very vertical. The students have to scroll through to see what they have to do for each day. Um, and the issue, the major issue with this is because of the number of tutorials for a chapter, it resulted in a lot of slow load times for students. So the pages would take a really long time to load because of all the embedded videos. Um, and this was a, a big thing that influenced how I decided to redesign the course for the fall semester. And also some students were a little bit confused with due dates. So we wanted to see how we could make that a little bit clearer to them and so they wouldn't have to dig through so much to find out what was due. 
So this is scrolling through the a typical lessons page of the fall course. You'll see the tutorial videos have been removed. There's just weeks, assignments listed, links to assignments, and then subpages. And the subpages, there's a subpage for each week, have the tutorials that the students have to watch for each week. So instead of all chapter tutorials being on one page, they were divided up into which tutorials students had to watch in certain weeks, and this really helps with the load times. So again, you can see here, we have a clear delineation with what's due when, and the tutorials have been removed from the chapter pages. And this is what the, the course currently looks like as Dana is teaching it now. And um, finally, Dana's, we're going to be wrapping up, and, and Dana's just going to review the content changes that she decided to make after doing the summer course. Um, so besides Christie's redesign, which helped immensely, um, I had much less student questions about when things were due. It really made a huge difference. I decided to also use the scheduler to add in a course calendar with, all, with due dates. So it's like I took the syllabus, which, you know, on an online course, the syllabus is a little stagnant, like it's, the students, it's easier for them to see what's due on the calendar rather than go back and forth to that syllabus tab. So I put everything that was due on the calendar. Um, now you know the assign, like some of your quizzes and tests go directly onto the calendar, but there were things I manually had to enter, like the voice threads and the Wiley Plus homework, which is our book. Um, also I added more collaboration, so like that last voice thread slide that you saw where the students collaborated, I tried to do that twice this semester and I think I'm going to add it three times next semester because I think that works really well with having students work together and get to know each other. And I'm going to implement those changes for Spanish 2. We're going to set Spanish 2 up the same way. So students have already had me, there won't be such a learning curve. And it'll just kind of add continuity to the course. So other than these changes, I think we're going to keep everything else the same. So I gave an, a very informal survey. Um, <laughs> I should have structured the, the questions made possibly a little different, but I just wanted to get feedback from my summer course before I did the fall course so I could make changes. And most of the feedback, I'd say 95% of the feedback was extremely positive, even though it was a lot of work for them. I mean, you know, five hours a day, it was 25 hours a week they were working on Spanish. But they really liked the course. Um, they really liked the voice threads. It really helped them understand, and the students felt like they were able to speak Spanish fluently, which is amazing. I mean, you know it's not fluent, it's Spanish 1, but they had this idea and a perceptions reality where they're actually speaking Spanish, which is what I wanted. Um, students liked that they could speak it every day in practice and get feedback, whereas in class, you know, I have up to 35 students when I teach in class here, and you can't listen to every student in every class personally. So this was a way for them to actually be heard. Um, students really liked the short tutorials, and they liked that I gave personal feedback. Personal feedback was very time consuming, but I really felt as a professor it was essential. The students need to feel like they're heard, they need to feel like what they're doing is for a purpose, and they need to, get, they need to understand their mistakes. So I was glad to hear that they enjoyed the feedback. And students just like the varied outlets for learning. Um, as a professor, I like to give students different ways to learn because everyone has a preferred way to learn. Some students like to read, some students like to hear things, some students like to watch videos. So I played into all this. I really tried to give them a varied experience so that everyone could feel like the course was tailored to them. Um, so do you feel that you have learned the skills? Explain that the objective session this is very important for us as a department. Um, the, object, the objectives were about maybe 20 different course objectives, and most of them felt like they learned the objectives, and even there was no one that said no. Some students said somewhat, but I think you're always going to get that in any course, whether it's online or in person. Would you recommend this course for friends? And it was overwhelmingly positive, 82%, so I was really happy with that. And that pretty much wraps up our presentation. So um, we have about 10 minutes left in the session, so we can take any questions that you may have. Do you want to put the webcam? Yeah, and we're going to see if we can share a webcam. <laughs> Let's see. If anybody has any questions, they can uh, post them any questions. If you want, I can uh, unmute you if you wanted to talk. Can you see us now? Yeah, can you guys see us? <laughs> yep. Okay. 
nine people. Yeah, early yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. I know early on we had some audio problems for those of you that had uh, some audio issues. Like I said, everything was re is is recorded, so we'll get uh, the uh, recording out to the Aperio YouTube channel. So if you missed the first uh, few minutes of the session, that uh, it was recorded, so it'll be posted later. Yeah, we can always go review if that's you know a question that you want to ask. Yeah. We can review some of the things that we talked about in the beginning if anyone missed it. Uh, Christy, can you see the questions area? Yeah, we don't see anything. Yeah, that's the only thing I don't see anything oh, in yeah. it. Just show answer so I, yeah, we don't There's see any no text there. Okay, I can I can uh, forward them along. So uh, Emily asks, it sounds like so much work for the instructor. How many hours per week do you really spend on the course? Well, I'm going to be totally honest with you. <laughs> I work a full-time job apart from Rutgers, but when I was developing this course, it took me 50 hours to make it up, five, zero. Um, it took me a lot of time. Um, but it's because I really wanted to do it right. I really wanted to give them this experience, and I gave them in the summer about, oh gosh, at least four different assessments a day, I would think, right? I had a lot, like in the fall it's two. And the way I split up in the fall is I do um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday due dates, and I have at least two things due every day. Um, it's about, in the fall semester, it's between four and five hours of grading a week. And plus it took me about 10 hours to set up the course again for the fall because I had to make edits and I had to change all the due dates. And Christy had to redesign it. I had to split it up in a 16-week semester rather than a four-week summer course. So that took about 10 hours. Yeah, that was. But then Christy will copy that again for me for next fall. So I'll have that set up already made so that won't take me 10 hours again. But doing the due dates again does take, you know, probably about four hours to set up all your due dates again for the semester. And like I said, another five hours a week grading. In the summer it was four hours a day, four to five hours a day grading, but like Christy said, the summer's condensed. So that's not abnormal. Like when I taught summer course here, I was here for, it was almost four hours, right? Yeah, that's and a half hour class. And then I took another hour office hours, so I was here five hours a day in the summer anyway. So that comes out to about the same time that you'd spend in the summer. Okay. Uh, another question is from Paul. Do you ever have students get confused when they have to go to the test and quizzes to get assessment feedback while they are used to accessing most things through the lessons tool? No, because of the way Christy set it up. So Christy, can you explain? Because the way you set it up, they weren't confused about accessing it at all. And the feedback was automatic. Does it email it to them? I don't know how it does it. So no, it doesn't email it to them. The students see it um, if they click on tests and quizzes, then they can see all the quizzes that they've taken and then they see the feedback there. Um, so we actually don't have anything on the ind indicating on the lessons pages that they can see their feedback, but I know that um, Dana usually says through text announcements yeah. or um, through her video messages that the students should be looking for that. Yeah, I tell them like I send them a text announce or an email announcement every day almost, even in the fall, because I tell them, everyone, blank quiz has been graded, please look for your feedback. So I'm constantly prompting them to look for feedback. Yeah, and she also gives, um, in one of our slides we had a, a screenshot of the intro page, and it has, a, she does a screencast for each part of the course, so a quick tour of Sakai, a quick tour of VoiceThread. So the students can see the different things that they should be clicking on, um, and they should be clicking on things outside of just the lessons pages. Right, and then I quiz them on it. So, like, I know which students don't understand. Like, if I give them a quiz on how to access the quizzes and the assessments, and they get my answers wrong, then I'm emailing them privately. Hey, you really struggled on this quiz, but what you struggled on was you don't understand how to access the quizzes, so let me walk you through it. Please watch the webinar again. So I try to get all of that out of the way within the first week of the course. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Christy, Dana, uh, thank you. I think that's it for the questions. Um, I'll go ahead and stop.